I'd like to introduce Susan James, our Vice President of Programming and Publications. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hi. I'm also um, the Assistant Director here at Bayless Library. Uh, I have some thank yous and a few announcements also. Um, I want to, of course, thank Neil Moran for speaking tonight and Ken Miller in the back, our library director, for agreeing to host this joint uh, library and historical society program. And thank you also to Carolyn and Person and Janet Russell and Mary for the refreshments. Uh, Neil Moran has a bachelor's degree from Lake Superior State University and a diploma in horticulture with an emphasis on landscape design from the University of Guelph in Ontario. He's written over 500 articles and authored three books and e-books. He's a journalist and regular blogger on gardening. His books over on the table are available tonight for sale and signing. From 1998 to 2010, Neil was a horticulture instructor in the career and technical education program. He taught introductory and advanced horticulture skills to adults, including landscape design and maintenance, turf grass science, and greenhouse management. Tonight, he'll delve into the past to take a look at the history of gardening and local food production and gathering in this area. I'll also talk about the increasingly popular heirloom seeds and share some of the interesting stories behind some of these cherished varieties. His talk is titled Heirloom Seeds and Native Plants. Please welcome Neil Moran. Yeah, thank you very much, Susan, and thanks for inviting me tonight. Um, yeah, I get started here. Um, kind of interesting research. Normally, when I talk about gardening topics, it's usually, you know, how to grow vegetables or flowers or design the flowers, how to grow the biggest pumpkin or whatever. <laughs> and this time around, I was asked to talk, you know, a little more about the history, which, um, you know, turned out to be some interesting research, which I'll share uh, with you here. Um, yeah, we'll talk. Uh, We'll talk about it just, I mean, you know, I title it Very Brief History of the Origin of the Seeds and Plants. I mean, it's a topic that we could talk about for days probably. So just going through a few things, uh, some inter interesting research I did. And then we'll talk about heirlooms and, uh, you know, kind of compare the heirlooms to hybrids and things like that, explain what that's all about, which is gonna be more and more popular. And then, um, you know, I'll touch on wildflowers um, I won't get into the nitty gritty of, you know, how to grow them and all that, that would be for another night, but um, I will talk about, you know, how it kind of relates to history and um, how we kind of, you know, really should kind of preserve native seed to some extent, like we're preserving uh, old buildings and so forth, so, so I'll get started here. Um, actually, uh, Flowering plants are believed to be about 140 million years old. Some people say that's you know, actually fairly recent because um, non-flowering plants, you know, like the spore producing ferns and so forth, go back you know, like 200 million years. So at some, at some point there was an evolution you know, in, in those non-flowering plants that we you know, started to have flowering plants, which we call the angiosperms. I um, thought this was kind of interesting just to kind of show you where, um, you know, I think we just kind of take a lot of things for granted, you know, with our tomatoes and corn and flowers, you know, where did these come from? You know, they didn't just all of a sudden, you know, appear like we know them today. And this is a good one. Um, corn, as we know, is, is in just about everything. Corn flakes, the wall board, uh, or drywall. Uh, we feed our corn to cows, chickens, pigs, we fuel our cars, we've got, you know, the high fructose corn syrup. Um, you know, it's hard to, to eat just about anything that, that hasn't been that somewhat related to corn. Um, but where did it come from? Um, corn was actually, this is kind of a peculiar one, in, in the fact that corn was originally uh, just a grass. Um, and grass has what they call a ligule, kind of like a little, you've probably seen a little stem coming out. 
and or, or sheath, you might say. Um, so here it says, you know, somehow it was bred, you know, we think by Native Americans um, to somehow produce this corn cob, you know, or, or a corn ear. It says came from gamma grass to yield teosinte, if I'm pronouncing that right, and then possibly with back crossing the teosinte to primitive maize to produce our modern races. Um, there's thousands of hybrids and um, and these days they do a lot of crossing. When we talk about crossing plants, I won't get into that um, too deep here, but a lot of times they're crossing a lot of different uh, hybrids to form, you know, new selections that in modern agriculture that, that uh, kind of fit the bill for disease resistance and production, you know, in the big ears or whatever. So, um, unfortunately though, and I think this is a good example of a lot of of modern vegetables and you know things we eat, potatoes and things like that. Some of the old vi varieties are dwindling. You know, I mean, if nobody's planting them, you know, eventually they're gone. Which, which kind of is going to bring me to heirlooms here in, in a couple of minutes. So, um, so th I thought that was kind of interesting, just to see, you know, how far we've come to what we have. You know, that nice big sweet ear of corn that we like to eat. Um, and then here's another um, example of, of something that I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, would interest you um, and also give us an idea where, where something came from in this, in this case, of, case of fruit. Um, so the story of Johnny Appleseed from a book called Michael Pollan's Body of Desire. Anybody read that besides uh, <laughs> Ernie? <laughs> Ernie? Uh, you lent it to me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is an interesting story. Um, you know, I think we all remember from our school days, you know, the story, and, and, and the way I remember it was, you know, this guy, barefoot, just like in the picture, throwing these seeds, you right and left, right, and, and they grew up and got these nice big apples, and, you know, I just, I had no, no reason not to believe that story. Well, uh, Mr. Pollan, who's, you know, written this book and some other books on food, in food history and that kind of thing. Um, he did his own research on this. There's a, there's a few problems with the story, <laughs> as we heard it in the book. Um, he traveled around in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and um, and when you think about it, you know, you take seeds and you go out here, even if it was on the front lawn here, and you threw seeds down, or back then maybe in the plains or on the edge of a forest, you know, are they really going to sprout and grow anything? You know, think about that for a minute. You know, probably not. Um, and another thing back then is we just didn't have big red apples. That came, you know, just like dogs being bred from wolves, that took a long time, a lot of breeding before we had that. So, you know, he says what the real story is, is that he, all the apple varieties in the United States have been grafted. Apples are uh, native to Russia. And uh, with Alvin Grafton and what this, how the story goes is that he had, had uh, homesteaded some land and he would graft these apples. He would take and plant them, you know, you know in these homesteaded piece of property. And then as the settlers came along, he was an entrepreneur. Um, so they would buy those tracts of land from him. Well, the apples weren't really big enough just to eat. They were small, they were kind of sour. So um, the story is that they probably bought it to make uh, booze. <laughs> so, so that's kind of the real story about that. And what I like about that too, I mean, not only is it kind of humorous, but you know, also kind of explains a little bit, uh, you know, where things come from. You know, you talk about kids these days, not knowing where food come from uh, comes from, but I think even adults, you know, sometimes we kind of forget, um, you know, just. Uh, how far back this goes and how far we've come, you know, and, in, 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 you know, how we get a large apple of delicious or a Macintosh. It's been years of, you know, breeding and grafting and so forth. Um, the gatherers, I didn't do a whole lot of research on this, but um, 
you know, in this area, um, I did talk to one uh, Native American uh, out in Grimley. Um, she said this is what she kind of remembered uh, from her mother and that, you know, was gathering the blueberries, uh, the cattails they would use. I think the root part of it tasted a little bit like a cucumber and then we used to gather that. Um, uh, cranberries in the bogs um, and the hazelnuts which you still see around and the strawberries, the tiny strawberries, you know, which you've probably seen around the growing wild. So, so you know, we, we had some of that, a lot of that going on. And then, of course, the Indians sustained themselves a lot from the fishing and hunting. Um, uh, Guardian in the Sioux, and um, I want to thank Dee Stevens, who's with us tonight. Uh, in the back row there for doing some research for me on this. Um, again, it's, you know, sort of hard to find this history, and if, if there's anything, you know, you want to add that you know about, especially you, Bernie, maybe you've come across some things, but here's what, here's what I've, um, Dee shared with me. One was on the shrubs and wildflowers, which I'm interested in, and this is from May 31st, 1905, and uh, it's kind of interesting they talked about, um, this is a fellow who said, the result of a botanical tour of Chippewa and adjacent counties, and um, you know, he went about in the wild and, and pretty local here, pretty close by, and he said he found things like the heath, with, which is a leather leaf, leather leaf and Labrador tea. Are people familiar with those? Mm -hmm. They, those are found in the bog regions mm -hmm. and what they call the fens in the area. And what I found interesting is you still find, I mean, it's here we are over 100 years later, and those are still in the bogs. Um, chokeberry, um, speckled alder, you know, lots of that. Um, trying to think of the other tag alders, you know, we call them. Um, the hazelnuts, talking about um, the the shrub willows and the pussy willows, which is a salix. Um, mountain maple and moose wood maple. I thought that was kind of interesting. I know an old fellow there, he's 95 now. In fact, he's up visiting. And um, there's a tree, it's called the, I call it the box elder, and he just, he won't have anything <laughs> of that nature. That's not a box elder, that is a mountain maple, he says. So, so here, you know, here it kind of gets into that common name thing with plants too that can cause confusion, but you know, people in some ways common names are, are like nicknames and that's why we have botanical names, which um, which would be Acer for that one. I can't think right off, but it's an Acer, you know, would be maple, so that would be the uh, genus of that species. Um, sweet gale, which I've seen in the area, and then he says around Government Island and all the small islands, uh, as well as the Canadian shore, they had found dogwoods, um, which, you know, I've seen uh, alternate leaf dogwoods and the red osiers, and those are still uh, pretty common around here. And then this part I thought maybe somebody here could help him with, it says um, one uh, fine bush, if you read it here, um, they've seen on Chandler Heights, a little, uh, sounds like close to Dunbar, it says close to the Dunbar house. What, what would Chandler Heights be? Anybody know? Uh, well, I know where the Dunbar house was exactly, too. It was shared to drive in the summit right at the corner there. Where? Uh, Sheridan Drive and S Summit right on the corner there on the southwest corner. That's oh. where the Dunbar's left up in there someplace. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Chandler Heights about 1905. And then they found uh, the high bush cranberry, which is viburnum. You see some. I don't see too much of that in the wild these days. Um, trailing arbutus or arbutus, or you want to call that, that's still pretty popular or pretty common. Um, clematis or virgin's bower, um, that's got the sort of cottony, I don't know if you call it cottony, but a real viney and then, you know, frilly like cottony. You know. And then, um, so the clear, a curious plant, very common on the islands at Little Rapids is the American yew or ground hemlock. And there again, that, that's still pretty common around here. 
um, in the Low Birch, uh, Betula, and Palmito. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Ilex Verdic Colada, that's um, black alder or winterberry. And if you go on the, the city golf course here, you'll see in the late fall, you'll see the winterberry, the real red berries. Um, it's actually like a holly, real hardy holly. Um, and so yeah, I thought that was, was kind of interesting there. And then some other things here. Um, and then this, I, I don't have any knowledge of this, but it says um, in the Shingwak Bog, wherever that was, is a rich field for orchids. <gasps> Here grows the great green orchids, the lovely rose purple erethus uh, and rose colored snake mouth begonia. Mm -hmm. Probably on the other side of there by the Shinglock residence, the school, Algoma University puppy over there or something. Oh, okay, yeah, so they're the talking about across the, <laughs> across the river, okay. Yeah, um, yeah that, well, that'd be neat. I've seen the, uh, you know, the pink lady slippers here and, mm -hmm. and the yellow ladies look at the north you know, so. um, and then um, <coughs> moving on to some gardening here you know so what's been going on garden wise you know these days we have the farmers market and we seem to have more people getting into uh, you know growing uh, vegetables and that foods for the market well, 52 is nothing new, 52 years. Um, this is from 1938, May 26, 1938, Evening News. It says, 52 years of supplying Sioux merchants with garden truck greens mm. and other perishables have given George Preslin, who celebrated his 73rd birthday today, distinction of being the first and oldest truck gardener in this area. So 52 years of that in 1938. So he, he started uh, before the turn of the century. Um, and um, so it's uh, Gardenville, let's see. Gardenville is a small gardening area of a half dozen farms just off Riverside Drive. I have heard of that, off Riverside Drive and overlooking <coughs> St. Mary's River. It was named by George Pressman when he settled there 45 years ago to make his living out of some of the richest soil in Chippewa County half a dozen farms. I have, has anybody heard of that? Bev Young, if you know her, I think mm -hmm. there's some farming history there. I remember on one of the um, um, flower show or, you know, flower walks that we had. So, so that, that was kind of interesting going back. Um, I did talk to, again, I talked to my friend there, he's 95. He didn't have anything too remarkable to say about gardening. He said his parents, you know, used mail order, but Pretty much, you know, gardening wise, went down to McGinnis. I don't know if anybody remember that uh, yeah. place. I'm, I do. I, I've been here since '78, so I do remember going in there, and that was always uh, kind of neat going in there. To, but uh, that's been gone now for quite a while. That was over on Arlington Street, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and then here are just some clippings from the paper that was kind of interesting. This is from May 21st, 1928, Evening News. It says, Lavatera seed has arrived. This must have been big news <laughs> back then in 1928. Maybe had free of charge at CMC office, which is what? Civic and commercial. That was the Chamber of Commerce, but yeah. That's oh, okay. Earlier version Civic of that. Civic and commercial, okay. Yeah. Uh, it says, following the policy adopted last year, Lavatera seed for the Sioux's adopted flower will again be distributed free of or by the Civic and Commercial Association. Mm -hmm. The quantity of seed divided into envelopes is now at the association office in the Hotel of Jibwe. It may be attained for the asking. Children should have a note from their parents in requesting the seed. Why don't we take those seeds home do something? I didn't want to waste them. That reminded me of nothing related to gardening, but when I was a kid, we used to go up to City Hall and get light bulbs. They give you a light bulb to be charged. And the city in the light department fixed your dryer. And that was a small town I grew up in. And when you had something wrong with your dryer, you'd call the light department and they'd come over and fix your dryer. <laughs> Not your washer, just your dryer. So, 
Yeah, I'm getting to the age where I've got a few stories now. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get after my dad for telling so many stories, but um, turned out I just like him, I think. Um, and then, this, this sounded really beautiful, if you can kind of imagine it. A.H. Eddy has half acre of flower garden. Um, it is blooming in one of the most beautiful sites in the Sioux. This is in 1924. July 1924. Some men collect stamps to pass the leisure hours, others fish or hunt or attend movies. A.H. Eddy's hobby is in growing flowers. Over on the northeast corner of Minneapolis Street and 4th Avenue, which um, for you new, new folks would be right over yonder here, a few blocks over, um, is a half acre of flowers. They are all in bloom now, long rows of peonies, sweet peas, and tulips that blend into one great bed of red, white, and crimson. Now that the flowers are in bloom, Mr. Eddie goes to his garden each Sunday morning and gathers huge bouquets. Some are given to the churches and other institutions of the city, and each patient in the memorial hospital is given a bunch Aww. of peonies. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, flowers are the hobby and uh, are his hobby and has resulted in adding beauty to the city and the interior of some of the public buildings and bringing joy to those <coughs> who are combined at the hospital. And um, um, in my job out of the prison, that's what we did. We grew a lot of flowers um, uh, and distributed them to the city and sometimes went up to the hospital with uh, poinsettias you know, at Christmas time and that. I do miss that aspect of the, mm -hmm. of the program, which is no longer going, but it was kind of a nice thing that they did for the uh, people. Um, and then, just, uh, well, let's do this one here first. Busy planting trees. This is just uh, Street Commissioner Fleming. This is back in 1908. Street, anybody remember this guy? Should <laughs> 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 be anybody to hear it. Street Commissioner Fleming and a crew of men got busy at once yesterday at the work of setting out the uh, 1,000 shade trees of the gifts of J.C. Osborne to the city, which arrived yesterday afternoon. During the afternoon, trees were set on Bingham Avenue between Portage and Spruce and some other places. The work is being pushed today on the north and south streets be portage and spruce in accordance with the plan adopted by the special committee. So we were spruicing up the, and of course we continue to try to do that. Don't we? Um, and then this one is sort of some sad news, I guess 1908, he says, uh, injured trees with a knife. You know, we complain about kids these days, vandalizing, I guess it's nothing new, this is back in 1908. <laughs> So a certain element in the city seems of late to be seized with a mania to injure and destroy shade and ornamental trees and shrubbery. The number of trees that have attracted attention uh, during the past few weeks is so large as to cause more than usual, con usual concern among officials and citizens. And then it just goes on to, you know, talk about how they were trying to catch this person and had some leads, but so kids will be kids, I guess. So that, so I kind of share that. And thanks again to Dee for that. Yeah, and then I thought we'd talk about the heirloom seeds. Um, it's pretty interesting, and, and uh, uh, you know, the old varieties being traded and saved, and um, really it's just, it's something that's, you know, gone on for, generations um, I mean it used to be that farmers saved their seed and just replanted you know and, and um, mm -hmm. but you know all over the world especially in third world countries you know up in the I know like up in the mountains of Peru and that um, you know it's a big deal to be saving and exchanging seeds and I mean this is your you know your livelihood or whatever how you eat so um, so of lately, you know, and I'm not really sure why, but it just seems like anybody growing any heirloom varieties right now? It just seems like um, these become very popular, though. And um, so, how are they different from the modern hybrids? Um, 
you know, the hybrids we have these days that we're planting, um, you know, from a gardening perspective, there's nothing really wrong with them. They're just natural crosses <coughs> from one, you know, cross-pollinating plants and coming up with, and actually that's kind of where heirlooms came from is that crossing also. But in the case of heirlooms, they've just been, they've passed on from generation to generation. They've, they've planted and then they've saved the best seed, you know, from that tomato or whatever and we replanted that the next year and kept kind of improving on it, but saving it, you know, and, and recording it, knowing where it came from. Um, and one thing I'm a little bit concerned of is, is I've, you know, in some garden class, I've heard people almost talk like these are something wrong with hybrids. Um, you know, in my opinion, nothing really wrong with them. I mean, I mean as far as health and eating them, they're just, they're just crosses. Um, I guess the things that I guess the thing that's really made hybrids or um, heirlooms popular, though, is that a lot of the modern hybrids um, we've sacrificed taste a little bit for being able to keep for thousands of miles, being shipped from California to Michigan or whatever. Um, you know, and, and somewhere along the line, people have gotten interested in you know coming up with some of those old tasty varieties. Um, there's a um, seed company out of Decora, Iowa, um, Seed Savers Exchange. I remember back maybe 20 years ago, you'd see a little ad in the back of Organic Gardening where they'd say, you know, if you have, have seeds to exchange, you know, call us or write or whatever, whatever you have. Now they're a big organization, I think is, you know, recognized, you know, around the world. It's really kind of almost a phenomenon what they've done to um, obtain, you know, heirlooms, varieties, you know, and record them. And I'm going to give you an example of, of some of the language on some of these. Um, it is pretty interesting. But um, a couple of things I'll mention though, GMOs are quite different and I won't get into my opinion on these right now, but genetically modi modified organisms are something where they've taken a seed and they've literally injected, they actually sort of shoot it, I don't know how this happens really, but they can shoot an element into that seed and it could be, um, in the case of corn, it could be um, Bt, um, which is a, kind of a natural uh, insecticide. They can shoot that in there and then if the insects eat the corn, they die because that's in there. Of course, we're eating the corn too. <laughs> um, that's sort of the rub with that. And then there's what the, you've probably heard of Roundup Ready soybeans and stuff. You know, same thing. They've injected something in there. It's not really a natural cross like hybrids. To me, hybrids is just, you know, pollinating different varieties, you know, in nature. So, um, the, you know, there's a lot of things that you could say about GMOs, but I won't get into it. But one of the, the harm they're saying that GMOs can do right now is that if if there's you know 100 acres of GMO corn planted and you're next door with your heirlooms that pollen can drift over then next year you know your heirlooms are no longer heirlooms you know basically I mean they're never, no longer pure um, so that's getting to be kind of an issue um, and then can't they come after you for ha having their your their seeds on your property and not <laughs> yeah, have your yeah yeah they've done that it's really yeah crazy. yeah that started out with um, with a situation up in Canada with yeah. a guy with uh, canola and uh, he spent I think he finally won that but I mean he spent thousands and thousands of dollars he had canola planted and he was one of the old farmers that would collect his own seed and replant it and then the GMO pollen drifted over and he went to replant and they said well no we've got a patent on this <laughs> the stuff that you're planting we've got a patent on it which <laughs> this seems crazy to me but um, and that's you know that's continuing to be a fight and you know like like I say you know people that are growing uh, the heirlooms it's getting increasingly difficult not to have that <coughs> contaminated so so I don't know where, where that's all going to play out, but I think we're going to hear a lot more about it. Um, which sort of brings me down to why are they important, why are the heirlooms important? Um, 
this kind of goes back to you know what I read from uh, Michael Pollan there is the uh, monoculture you know this idea and a good example is potatoes you know we keep planting the same potato russet potato because who likes those potatoes so much anybody know so McDonald's you know they want that perfect <laughs> slicer you know or Burger King or whatever and um, the problem with that though is they're doing that monoculture all that one potato some of these other varieties could be falling away so what happens if this particular russet you know if you think of the Irish potato famine what if this one all of a sudden is, is not resistant anymore to a disease or insect where are we at then what if we can't find another russet somewhere you know to start in production again so that's why heirlooms are important I mean I think it's it's real important that we, that we preserve some of these for that reason, you know, the fact that they could uh, uh, could be, you know, really needed. And they will be, and probably are, they probably are using them in that fashion, so. Any other thoughts on that, or? Question? Uh-huh. Several years ago, I was working <coughs> in the West, and um, we were working in the Federal Highway Administration, and, um, I thought it might be kind of nice if we used some wild flower seeds in our cut areas. And um, of course, they didn't know they liked that enough. Of course, it's on National Forest Land, who I happen to be working for. Mm -hmm. So I said, uh, well, you know, let's see if we can get any wild seed. Well, this was in the 60s. Uh -huh. It was virtually impossible. To really? Wild yeah. Seed. And I, I contacted a fellow in Billings, Montana, and one in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got some. But uh, I got onto the projects, and about 10 years later, I went and looked at a catalog, and there were sure a lot of firms involved in oh, yeah. producing wild seed at that time, huh. 10 uh -huh. years after that, because people started using wild seed in difference to using something that would be uh, genetically improved or, or something would be uh, hybridized or something. That's what. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing, you know, the wild plant. You know they're needed in those areas for the butterflies, for the pollinating insects. You know wild, you know all the wildlife that might eat those plants. You know native wildlife eat, need native vegetation, right? Or native food. So, so that you know, yeah, that's the reason why. I mean, one reason. There's other reasons too. Things like um, you know erosion control and stuff like that. So, um, alrighty. Any other so this part I thought was really interesting. I just want to share a few of these. This is from uh, the Baker Seed Catalog. Um, it's rareseeds.com if you're on the internet there. Just give you an example. I got three three of these here I pulled out. But um, this historic heirloom was grown by Tom. I don't have the name of it. Anyway. It was offered commercially in the USA in 1824. This is the, if I can remember, the Minnesota Midget. Is it cantaloupe? Cantaloupe, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that. You know, when I saw that, I, I can not remember that. The Minnesota <laughs> Midget cantaloupe. <laughs> so, this historic heirloom was grown by Thomas Jefferson in 1794. It was offered commercially in the USA in 1824. It was illustrated in color in France in 1854, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this is what you'll find in the catalog, you know, this little history on them, and, and uh, you know, which makes it kind of interesting. And you'll also find your, you know, typical growing information, how many days to maturity, um, disease tolerant, uh, tolerance, and things like that, so. Um, this one here, I thought, anybody hear this yes. one, the morning yes. lifter? Uh, thought this was interesting. Uh, guy named Mr. Biles, they called him Radiator Charlie. <laughs> He had a radiator repair business and um, apparently not doing real good with that business. <laughs> so he had no experience, you know, crossbreeding and, and things like that, and, and, but, but he needed some cash, so he came up with the mortgage lifter, which turned out to be a popular heirloom. Um, so one dollar, uh, he then sold his heirlooms made of plants for one dollar each. 40s mm -hmm. paid off the six thousand dollar mortgage on his house in six years. Mm -hmm. A little bit of an entrepreneur story there too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we have the jet black hollyhock. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, this is at Monticello. Um, and here again, you know, it's one of these varieties that very, very old that we're hanging on to and uh, making sure that, you know, it doesn't go out of existence. Um, so that, um, yeah, and there's, you know, just uh, lots of these in that magazine. Um, one sort of word of, you know, maybe caution, I guess, with the vegetables, because that's kind of what I kind of favor the most, or, you know, interested in the most of the vegetable garden is, um, you know, with the heirlooms, you know, one reason we have hybrids is because some of these hybrids have been bred for disease resistance and they, for shorter growing season like up here, but, but there are also, uh, are also some heirlooms that are short season too. So just remember that, you know, if, if you want to plant some heirlooms, make sure that they still fit the criteria, you know, needed in this area, you know, fairly short growing season that we have, you know, which I always, in my garden talks, I usually mm -hmm. say around 65 to 70 days <laughs> of good growing weather, mm -hmm. so. Um, so just, you know, keep that in mind. And, and you know, and, and you might, uh, some of these might succumb to some uh, disease problems, so, you know, because they haven't really been bred like some of the modern, modern varieties. But the, um, the benefit is you're gonna find some really interesting varieties, interesting looking and tasting and uh, some of them like tomatoes especially you hear a lot of talk about the brandy wines and, and some others um, that uh, that really have the old sort of what they call the old-fashioned taste and there's some sources for heirloom seeds there's some other companies out there but um, uh, this is the one out of Iowa burpees now is you know here's a mainstream catalog that's selling them now and this one, this is at Baker Creek. Um, his story is just pretty interesting in itself, but he was just kind of a kid growing up on a farm out west that uh, got real interested in He seems a little eccentric to me, but um, he wrote a book on, on, the, on the heirloom seeds, and he's really pushing, he's opened up three stores across the country, and it's gotten to be quite a big, big thing, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, and then I just wanted to mention this, nothing real exciting about this, just sort of interesting that, you know, there are efforts around the world to hang on to these varieties. This is the Belvard Global Seed Ball in uh, Norway, uh, way up north, and um, very cold up there, but it's all funded, I believe it's all funded by the government and other concerns that have pitched in. It, it's free to, to send seed up there, it doesn't cost anything. But they, uh, they store it and, you know, I guess in the event of some sort of catastrophe or something, they would have seed, so. Uh, getting a little closer to home, um, you know, you can contribute seed if you have seed that, you know, grandma, grew or whatever, or, uh, you know, some varieties in your yard or whatever that, that are, you know, you think you could collect seed and pass on to the next generation. Um, we got Virgin Image Seed Saver Library out in Pickford, and um, you can check out seeds, you know, with a library card. Um, children, I think, have to have permission from <laughs> All right, now I've got to just kind of switch over here. Um, just bear with me for a second. Talk a little. Any questions or comments on uh, something I always say in my presentations, I don't uh, know everything about anything. I always like, you know, input from people. Okay, so growing and enjoying wildflowers. I'm not going to take you through the nitty-gritty of you know plant things and all that. Um, uh, basically, what I want is you know to see is just you know the importance of you know why we care. Um, 
And I think one reason, you know, in some ways, you know, uh, it's like, you know, historical society's interest in preserving buildings and things and history and documents and, and all those things. I mean, they're, they're part of our culture, um, but, you know, and, and, uh, and useful, you know, we learn from the past. Uh, and with flowers, wildflowers, there's also, you know, quite a, quite a need to, to carry this on, so. Um, and there's some different ones that are pretty common locally here. Um, Coreopsis, and everybody know those probably? Mm -hmm. They're over here. Yeah, uh, let me see. This has been a little rusty, but the blue flag iris. Anybody know that one? Yeah. Black eyed Susan, that one? Bee bomb, yeah. Monarch. Yeah. Monarch. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to do that. They'll go out at the prison. We drew them in the sand out there because we had we were sending them out to um, conservation districts and the DNR, and um, it was just amazing how deep rooted they were and, and how little care. I mean, virtually no care that we needed except weeding. We didn't need to water or fertilize them. Um, then this um, here, something I'll mention kind of quickly here, filter pollutants and runoff. I've done about three or four articles now on the natural shoreline uh, landscapes. Uh, MSU is, is one, has a partnership, they call it the Natural Shoreline Partnership. And um, they're, they, um, they're certifying landscapers now to go to like the lake, uh, people who own lake property and you know instead of having just like inland lakes instead of having the old-fashioned like riprap you know the rock riprap or um you know sometimes you see people even dumping all kinds of things in there to kind of hold the water back well they're there uh, this partnership is formed to use native plants to naturally you know buffer the and, and there's a lot of, i won't get all into it but there's a lot of advantages to that but it does kind of it's not really something for the weekend gardener to tackle if you want you can make an actual landscape however if you want to just buffer pollutants from going into the lake if you own you know lakeside property you can grow these and i like what you mentioned about not doing any mowing this plant here <laughs> this couple of years from brimley live on monaco lake saying they're going to leave the mower in the shed, right? We don't have a mower. <laughs> you don't have a mower. Don't right? need a mower. We live in the forest. <laughs> Who mows the forest? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, but these do, you know, and that, you know, relates to what you were saying. Now native plants are pretty popular. Native seed, you can, there's big companies that do this, sell it, they go in and do installation. And it's because the native plants will filter any kind of runoff, you know, from the streets, you know, where water, you know, enters the sewer system or whatever, you know, um, or I shouldn't say that, but go down the banks or the bank of your property and, and they're bringing in those pollutants um, from uh, herbicides and things like that. Well, these native plants will buffer that. Down in uh, Gaylord, uh, in that area, it's actually a zoning thing now where you've got to put a buffer in so many feet bad from your lake so uh, Ottawa County so so there's you know there's a real good practical application of wildflowers I think it's easy to think you know oh, what the heck you know there's why do we need wildflowers you know or whatever uh, especially in the UP but um, you know there'll come a day where it'll be a lot more up to as, as those issues you know those things become an issue pollutants and so forth they also flourish without fertilizers and place invasive species. And that's a real problem with invasive species. They come in and they push out, you know, that native flora. Uh, very few disease problems. Um, they connect us to our natural surroundings and history. And by now they're beautiful. <laughs> and yeah, I guess that was uh, any other questions or comments? In this area, there's not uh, really too many places now to go to buy native plants, but um, it is a move, kind of you know bigger movement downstate. And I think it's because you know there's more homes around the lakes and pollution's more of an issue in that. But. You know, one of the things that um, you mentioned, the, the gathering and so forth, the blueberries. During the Depression, uh, there were a number of people that came from down below, I guess, mostly, to the plains in Reiko to pick blueberries. I mean, they, they had no other mm -hmm. livelihood, and so really? blueberries were uh, a source of internet revenue. They camped out there for... Well, weeks on end, I guess. Mm -hmm. Wow. In the Rainbow area, too. Uh, that must be what happened with my family. The reason we're here, I mean, I'm a native of Chicago, mm -hmm. but we would come up to Bayview Beach Camp. Mm -hmm. We stayed in a tent for a month. Mm -hmm. My grandparents would be there for two months. 
my aunt and uncle and their and cousins would come up for a few weeks. And we kids would pick blueberries all along the lakefront, mm -hmm. eat half of them, mm -hmm. take mm -hmm. half of them back to <laughs> grandma. And she had a little trailer, mm -hmm. like the, in the Mickey Mouse cartoon, just one of those little. And she would make blueberry pie once or twice a year. And I mean, all of that goes into the reason why Steve and I chose to retire up here. Mm -hmm. um, but when you saw that, I also we also picked um, sugar plums and um, wintergreen berries. And I mean, I mean that's in my history that's 45 years ago, more. And uh, we bought our property, and there's wintergreen on our on our land. Oh. I'm like, oh my God, there's blueberries, there's wintergreen, and Steve's like. You sure you should eat that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I remember. You know, um, but I haven't seen any sugar plums at all, and I don't. I've never heard anybody say the word sugar plum. I remember exactly what it looks like. Yeah, I saw one today at uh, Pendles Creek when I was up there. Well, <laughs> that's, they're that's out near where we used to be. <laughs> so that makes sense. The pines you can see them if you go on the beach back, and they're just east of. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's where we used to. And there were central stations that they put them on the train and stuff, the blueberries and things like that. Really? Oh, I've got yeah. a chapter for you from, I think it's Kohler, I don't remember, it's that University of Mich Minnesota book. But he mm -hmm. was up here talking to the Native Americans about which things they used, all those things on your oh, list really? and how they used them, and I'll find that for you. Wow. wow. Right. Was it the rut of the cattail then that they were? Probably. Or, or the, maybe yeah. not the rut, but the Poofy brown, stuff. Like, yeah. To eat, too, you could eat it. Yeah. I, don't know, I have to read it again, too, but anyway, you'd love it, because it's uh, all about the yeah. things you're talking about. Yeah. Mm. Uh, <laughs> that reminds me of another use for cattails that I interviewing uh, an elderly woman 20 years ago, and uh, she said that uh, natives used to use cattails, put them in, like, diapers yeah. for, for uh, pampers to soak up that oh, sugar. Sure. Kind of uncomfortable for the baby. Yeah. Yeah. It's poofy. Uh, but it's yeah. nice. Hmm. Huh. Um, yeah. I was just going to say, I was kind of hoping when you're going through your articles that there'd be something about my grandpa, but he probably wasn't anything, you know, a lot of people probably garden, but I remember him having his whole backyard, a garden, and then out front there would be like, on either side of a center sidewalk, there'd be like nine different bushes of peonies, and people would be driving by and they would just stop and come talk to him about his peonies. Mm -hmm. But I used to think of how much he used to cringe with us running around playing tag around <laughs> all his plants <laughs> and, <laughs> and everything. Yeah. It was, he had a beautiful garden. Probably not. You know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, a lot of our you know, domestic plants that we do in South Africa. Yeah, what about the Jerusalem artichoke? Pardon? It's called Jerusalem. Oh, they I don't know much about that. Yeah. I have one in my. Yeah. Anybody know about that? Do they grow on roadways. Everybody got taller. Yeah, I don't know too much about that. This one is purple. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Is it the, more yeah. ornamental than to eat it? Was it? Yeah. I mean, I know know. You John Lehman used to own my house, oh. and uh, he used to eat the. I actually grew up in the thumb area of Michigan. And one of the memories I have is, and I tell people up here, and they just seem to look at me kind of strange, but down the street from us we had a processing plant, it was called Van Cams, mm -hmm. and um, they did peas and beets. But the peas, the kids loved the peas, and um, they, would, they would put the peas with vines in the trucks and if the train stopped the older boys this was the baby boom era and we had lots of boys in the neighborhood <laughs> they would run down they were pulling peas off the truck mm -hmm. and then us little kids would be putting in wheel <laughs> <laughs> you know so. peas were a big deal here p line oh, yeah. road out there and there was a dm ferry seed i mean for the pc peas right in town here oh, really? mm -hmm. so, yeah huh. So we'd sit on the, you know, I, every year I grow lots of peas because I just go out there and give me the peas because when I was a kid we'd sit on the curb and truck peas and throw them. And, uh, yeah, and then they went to, soon after they went to where they were actually shucking them, showing them in the fields, mm -hmm. and they come in and it's like bats. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, later at night I go down my bicycle and 
you know, one of the workers would let me, they'd be coming through and they'd let me take a bucket full <laughs> and bring them home to my mother and she'd find something. Wash <laughs> us. <laughs> we were mis mischievous. <laughs> never heard. Never heard anything. So, any other memories or comments? Oh, would you consider lupin wildflowers then? Are they native to this area? I know they're around a lot. Yeah, I know. Um, they're all on the list. Well, I don't. Something mm -hmm. kind of just tells me that they're they're not. But I mean, I know they grow. Mm -hmm. They grow wild. But, um, I suppose if enough farmers were planting them out in the garden there. Yeah. In the Bitterroot Mountains of uh, Montana, they were just everywhere. They're mm -hmm. all over the northern. Um, yeah, and it could be native to, to that area. Yeah, yeah, I'm not real sure they're sure native they're to yeah. this area, but northern Wisconsin. There, you know, those are everywhere. just like garden. You know what they call garden escapes. You know. Mm -hmm. what they, uh, yeah, and they, I'm sure they're native in some. Uh, Madeline Island, Island is covered with them. Really? Hmm. Uh, we used to, I don't know if we still do, but the, I, people, I never seen them, but on 123, they said there was quite a field of uh, purple coneflower at one time. Well, there is. They bought that. It's, it's a, a natu there. nature conservancy site, and they right about this oh, time oh. of year, another week or maybe right oh, about okay. now. It's uh, near, um, darn it. Um, North of uh, Moran, there, but I, I think there's a little mm -hmm. uh, lumber mill there that right near where it is. But Kenneth, Kenneth. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> South of the Trout Lake, it's, it is there. It was bought for a preserve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, this has been interesting. <laughs>